Okay, guys and girls, we're starting a little bit early because uh, Jupiter is setting down pretty quick over in the Philippines. We were going to begin at two, but we're just jumping ahead by about 30 minutes. Thank you, for everybody, for uh, coming over to watch the live stream with Christopher Go. Christopher Go, say hello. Hi there. Um, sorry, uh, it's still a bit dark here, and I'm on my PJs. Uh, we're here imaging Jupiter. The sky is clear. Seeing, unfortunately, is only 7 over 10, so it's not perfect uh, what we're used to. Uh, Jupiter is still quite low in the sky, around 40 degrees. So um, the reason why we're starting early is because sunrise is going to happen in, 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 in probably an hour. So uh, this would be the best time to image Jupiter before sunrise. And uh, um, you know, sunrise would uh, basically sometimes uh, uh, do bad things on the scene. So right now we're in the middle of doing an RGB cap capture of Jupiter. Uh, since we're going to do the rotation, I'm right now on the fourth set of my six set uh, imaging right now we're with, with a blue filter. Um, after we do the six sets, I will show you uh, a little bit on how to set up fire capture, um, especially when you're using a filter wheel. One thing nice about fire capture is that um, it automatically scrolls through the RGB. Uh, here we go. Uh, it's, this is the filter wheel that's basically doing all the work for me. Uh, changing the filters, uh, starting the exposure, uh, everything is automated uh, with uh, with fire capture. So here we go. We're doing the R. Uh, earlier, um, uh, after setting up, um, we actually used the green to focus on the image. Um, if you look at the image right now, the red is actually pretty good. Uh, we're coming up to the green right now. The quality is. I would say so, so. Uh, basically what we're having right now is that we have winds from the north. Uh, in my case here, in, in my location here in Cebu City, uh, uh, the best seeing comes from winds from the northeast, uh, east, south, southeast and south. Uh, this is the area where I get laminar flow or water from, uh, wind from the water or wind from the sea. So that's when you get good seeing. Right now, um, we're having some winds coursing through the mountains. That's why it's a little unstable, but overall, it's not that bad. Uh, you can still see a lot of features. This is the blue filter. You can see the great red spot on the lower right. Uh, it's uh, on the right side. Uh, the great red spot is about to set, and uh, you can see you know, the north equatorial belt and the south equatorial belt uh, clearly, even with the blue filter. Okay, we're almost going through with our last run with the RGB. You can so see what, on the right. So what time is it in, um, in the Philippines for you right now? It's around 4.30 in the morning. It's uh, 4.30 Philippine time. So is the mornings the best time to do imaging in general uh, for planets or All right, right just now, dark? Uh, actually, uh, right now, uh, Jupiter is still uh, on the eastern horizon it's still coming up uh we're, we're just starting the jupiter season right now so uh basically right now we're chasing the sunrise jupiter is still not on the uh, no it's it's not at its highest yet it's still uh it's still rising during sunrise so uh basically right now we're we're we're, we're just starting jupiter season right now that's why uh we're we're imaging basically close to sunrise Gotcha. Okay, so Sorry, we're going with the green to right join now. Us. Hey, no, no problem. <laughs> okay, so what I normally do is I, I get a set of RGBs, then I take a set of IRs, then a set of uh, methane band. Right now, because of the seeing, I normally don't do UV because UV is quite sensitive to uh, seeing. Okay, we're almost done. You, you can see uh, because uh, you know the this is my setting for the gain and exposure time. Each filter have different setting, but uh, for Jupiter, I normally keep the exposure time the same and just vary on the gain. Uh, sometimes when a haze would pass by, I would have to modify on the you know adjust on the uh, gain. Uh, or 
if a cloud passes by. So um, this is the green, this is where I usually focus. Um, uh, I have a motorized focuser here. Uh, this is the what, what I use. Uh, I, I use a moonlight uh, focuser, Crayford focuser. And uh, this is what I use for uh, focusing. So this is, uh, it's easy to have this uh, hand controller to, to focus. So what I normally look at is, I look at the South Equatorial Belt, the belt of Jupiter, and just check where I get the sharpest. And I can see some fine details here. Uh, so more or less, we get the focus now. Um, I'll, I'll go through all my imaging sets. We're going through IR. Normally, at this time of the year, I get I use five sets of IR. Then uh, we're going to go uh, through the methane band. Methane band takes about 12 minutes uh, to capture. OK, here we go. Is there anybody online yet? Uh, there's, um, well, there's about 34 people, 35 just went up. Okay, if they have any questions, uh, they can ask them now. Oh yeah. So if you guys have questions, feel free to type away. Um, I don't know if some of you are still watching the NEF live event. Unfortunately, they did have a bit of a hiccup. So they were kind of running over time a little bit. And then we were also pressed for time because obviously Chris doesn't have a infinite night time over there. So what time is uh, sun up? It's about 5.30, so uh, yeah. So we'll push it to the very end. Yes, we'll push it to the very end. And uh, um, if we have time, we're gonna capture Mars. I think we can. So we're almost done. Yeah. After we do the methane ban, um, I think that'll be around uh, 2 p.m. your time. Uh, we can do the hardware run on how I set up the, uh, okay, there we go. So they're asking uh, what mm. size of telescope are you using today? Uh, I'm using uh, my trusty C14. I'm using a Celestron C14. And what mount are you using? I'm using an Astrophysics AP900 mount. Oh, okay, GTO. so a serious mount then. <laughs> yeah, you need, uh, you know, I've been using this mount since 2003 and it has never failed me. So uh, this is quite a durable mount. Uh, you know. uh, uh, so many people ask me, yeah. Oh, Martin is asking, are you using the auto guide feature on SharpCap to keep Jupiter in the center of, uh, in the field of view? No, I'm using fire capture now. Normally I would do that early in the evening, but early in the morning, no, because it takes some time to set it up. And uh, especially when you're chasing sunrise, uh, you really don't have time. I just do everything manually with, this, with my hand controller here and uh, it works well. So we're done with the IR. We'll proceed with the methane ban. Now using the methane ban is gonna be, uh, there you have it. Uh, we use two by two binning. The exposure time is rather long for methane ban. So I, I'm using this uh, feature with fire capture. This is, uh, this is basically auto capture. So, so this is gonna take about 12 minutes to capture. So I'm using two minute sets of uh, methane ban. Oh, so you're you running quite there, a sequence uh, then. Yeah. I use this only for methane ban because um, uh, this version of fire capture that I'm using has a quirk where if you change the gain, uh, you know, the, the whole thing fails, the auto run fails. So it won't capture on the second sequence. So for RGB, I do things manually because uh, you know you never know that a cloud would pass by or a haze pass by, and uh, you have to adjust the uh, the gain. You'll notice one thing um, here in this image: you see a bright spot here on the left side, a small bright spot. This is oval BA. So you have two spots: the the great red spot and oval BA on the field of view. 
you'll notice that in the methane band, these anticyclones are very bright. Uh, this is because uh, the methane band captures high altitude cloud. And one thing interesting this year is that the equatorial zone is very bright in methane band this year. And you can also see the, so uh, the south polar cap also bright in methane band. Or the so one of the questions hood. here is, um, you're on fire capture, uh, capturing an AVI. Is there any advantage over SER files? Uh, well, uh, it, it's really on preference. I, I prefer AVI over uh, SER. Uh, I think probably because, uh, you know, I can play it with any video player. Uh, but if you're doing 16-bit, uh, you will have to use SER. And I always use uh, SER when I'm imaging solar or lunar. Uh, that's, what, that's when I use 16-bit. Uh, but for uh, planets, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's not necessary. Uh, you can just use 8-bit. Uh, and uh, well, it's up to you uh, if you prefer SER or AVI. There's no processing, does it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, next question is, fire capture has the ability to control lots of the accessories. Is the focuser controlled there as well? Because I don't see them on the screen. No, no. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the focuser I have doesn't have a uh, automatic. I, I'm using a cheap uh, moonlight focuser with a servo control. So, uh, well, probably in the future, I'll get the I'll upgrade this. But, uh, you know, it's too expensive for me right now. <laughs> I mean, the Moonlight focuses are actually really good focuses to use. And even with the hand controller, it's actually quite useful in that capacity. I mean, you've got other options that you could always use. Um, you can always use the uh, Isato one from Prima Luce Labs or their Sesta mm. Senso. Uh, personally, I like to use Starlight Instruments focuses, especially with their handy stepper motor. And then, of course, Optec mm. has their version of the handy stepper motor. Yeah. Yeah. But I think uh, for, for this one, I really need, uh, because the step, steeper motor has the feedback. And uh, for, for this to be worth it, you know, the only time, uh, the, the only reason why you want to have an autofocuser or the, the, the computer controlled focuser is so that you, you can refocus in blue and go back to, uh, you know, because uh, when, when you're uh, focusing, the red and green more or less have the same focus, but it's the blue that's always the problem that's slightly out of focus. So uh, uh, it, it'll be handy, but overall for image quality, as long as you have a good red and green, uh, you, you can get a perfect image with just red and green. So we're doing the methane band right now. This is an 889 eight, nanometer filter uh, with I think uh, 16, uh, uh, 16 uh, nanometer bandpass or something like that. I'm using a chroma uh, methane band right now. So speaking of filters, um, somebody wants to know if the actual filters you are using are actually genuinely made out of glass. Yeah, it is, of course. These are chroma filters, chroma RGB and IR filters. The only filter that they have, uh, the UV, is from Astrodon. Uh, it is a UV mist filter from Astrodon. But the, the rest of the filters that I have, uh, I use Chroma. Cool. <laughs> so we're almost uh, halfway through the uh, methane band. It's 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 funny because um, uh, th this might not sound, this might not look like the best image, but scientifically. This is the image that has a lot of uh, things that you will see that will be of scientific value, uh, especially if there's an impact on Jupiter or a, an impact remnant. These features will be very bright on methane band. So anything, if there's an outburst on Jupiter where a basically an outbreak would occur either in the North Equatorial Belt or in the South Equatorial Belt or anywhere in Jupiter, a high altitude plume, this will show up on methane band. Oh, wow. So, um, okay. Well, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. So uh, even though, you know, this doesn't really look as nice as a color image, 
scientifically, this has a, a lot of value. Uh, but uh, you know, it takes time to cal to get a good image. Uh, uh, this one, I I really need six sets to have a decent image, so the final capture will be uh, you know won't be grainy. And if you notice, we're using very high gr gain right now. It's a uh, 465, and we're using probably one one sixth of a second, one seventh of a second exposure time. So just out of interest, you have six runs going on compared to what you would do with um, RGB. Why are you doing six runs on this particular set? Um, just to get the good signal to noise ratio. Actually with the RGB, I also did six runs. If you notice, uh, you can see all my data over here. Oh, okay. So you, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six RGB sets. I do five IR sets and six methane band. Uh, one thing interesting about methane band, after we do this, we're going to do a dark capture. So uh, it's easy for me because I have a flip mirror. So I, all I have to do is to close the flip mirror uh, and uh, capture the uh, dark, dark frames. So uh, in, a, in a while, I'll show you how to uh, capture dark frames. Uh, one thing about dark frames, you cannot capture single frame because uh, you know you get too much noise, and uh, the dark subtraction isn't going to look good. So what you actually do is uh, you capture five frames, and uh, this is what we're going to do uh, in uh, probably a little over four minutes. So any other questions, guys? Um, so another question here would be. From what you were saying yesterday about the binning, explain to people why are you doing binning on just uh, methane? Because uh, methane is very faint. Uh, you'll, you'll have very slow exposure time if you're not binning on methane. Uh, it, it's the only way to capture a decent image. And, uh, you know, because of long exposure uh, and, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, well, methane band is a narrow band filter. It's like using, uh, uh, you know, uh, the narrow band filters for deep sky. So um, the, the the light that goes goes into the chip is very low. You really need binning to get to get anything decent. Anyway, I will turn turn off binning so you'll see what Jupiter uh, looks like without binning. I don't think you'll see anything without binning. So. On average, how many frames should you capture per channel? Uh, well, it really depends on seeing uh, your telescope, your focal ratio, the gain you use. Um, you'll have to figure out that uh, what I would suggest is uh, first get about six to seven captures, then start derotating three, four, five, six, and just look at which goes best. Uh, different telescope, different cameras, uh, you know, different sky conditions have different settings. In my case, uh, with, with my setup, if uh, seeing is good, I will only do four RGBs. Uh, right now, since seeing is so-so, um, you know, average, I would do six. If seeing was about five or six out of 10, I would go as high as 15 sets. Uh, I don't know if you've actually used this yet, but Celestron actually has a motorized focuser for their SCT. Uh, have you actually used one before yet? Uh, well, the fo uh, is it a Crayford focuser? Because uh, the thing is, uh, I would prefer a Crayford because uh, if you're using, once you change, uh, you move the mirror, especially at this uh, uh, magnification or focal length that we're imaging, uh, you know, this, this planet would be out of the field of view. So oh, you so need a fine focuser. You need a Crayford focuser. Right, so for those of you who are watching this and want to understand a little bit more about this, so Martin was uh, talking about the SCT focuser that goes onto the actual knob that controls the mirror. Now, ideally, you should probably use a Crayford focuser on the back of the SCT and then lock the mirror down to avoid any kind of image shift. I mean, 
even though the newer versions of the, um, the C11 and so forth have the upgraded uh, mirror and focus locks, there is still a slight bit of shift as you tweak the actual fine focus, which can end up making the whole thing go out of the field of view. Oh, especially there's another with C14. thing. Uh, actually, there's another thing. We actually use the mirror lock because uh, if we don't mirror lock, there's what you call the focus creep. So uh, mm -hmm. that's the reason. Another reason why you're gonna use the Crayford focuser, because when you're mirror lock, you, there's really no way you can focus. <laughs> you can only focus one way. Right. Because of the luck. Uh, somebody's asking, do you have a social media account? <clears throat> so do you have an Instagram, Facebook, oh, yeah, and all I that do. stuff? Uh, that, I, ha that I have a obvious. Facebook account. Do you want to tell everybody what it is? Okay. Uh, Christopher, go. Uh... <laughs> so there okay, you go. There go. Um, we're done with the methane ban. Uh, we're going to turn this off. I'm gonna close the uh, flip mirror. Here you go, it's closed, it's dark. So look at here, limit five frames. So I normally take two captures of the dark frames. Uh, and the reason is because um, uh, before, uh, I, when I trade, when I used one, uh, sometimes the, the, the dark frame di didn't come out very well. So you can see the dark, you know, the dark uh, hot spots, hot pixels. So uh, the dark frame will take care of that. Okay, we'll open back and uh, we'll go back to RGB before we go to Mars. Oh, do you want to just show what it looks now? like? Do you want to show um, what it looks like without the 2x binning real quick? Oh, okay, okay. There. Oh. This is how Jupiter looks like without the two X beaming. So you don't really see anything. Okay, we're back to green. Okay, let's see. We, we may have to refocus again. Seeing's getting a little better now. Let's see, I'm actually refocusing on the green right now. You can see uh, the oval BA over here and another spot over here. Oh, that looks perfect. I'm now focusing on this dark spot over here to see wh when we get the best contrast. Okay, we'll do another six runs over here. It's almost, uh, yeah, okay. almost 5 a.m. So um, we're, it'll take about nine minutes to do the six runs. Then we're going to move to Jupiter. Um, it's actually almost sunrise right now. Uh, it's, it's already twilight. You can see uh, the sky is getting brighter. Uh, Simon, can you uh, turn on the webcam of the other laptop? Sure. Let's see if we can get it working. Not this one, the other one. Oh, sorry. Um, how do we lose this? Two seconds. So you notice that uh, everything based on histogram. Here you can see it's about 90 plus percent. So this is how I uh, change my gain <laughs> to make sure it's about between 90, as long as it's below 100 percent. It's still dark. <laughs> Well, it's still dark. Um, let's see. Uh, you can see it's it's almost twilight. It, uh, we... All right, they should see. Oh yeah, that one can see it now. Yeah. 
Hopefully nobody saw it's my uh, slowly, Zoom go to uh, meeting ID number and password because then I'm going to get flooded with people. <laughs> hmm. The seeing is a little unstable, but uh, probably around seven over ten. So we're going with the green. So Mike from Asteroid Hunters is asking about cooling. Did you acclimate the scope? Did you cool the camera down or, or are you running any type of cooling at the moment? Uh, you know, there's no need to cool because it's still early in the morning. So uh, I think overnight the, 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 the OTA has cooled. Oh, the seeing has deteriorated. <laughs> Uh, at least we had an earlier capture, uh, decent capture earlier, but uh, it seems like, uh, yeah. Normally early in the evening, I would cool my uh, C14. Uh, it takes about probably two to three hours to cool the C14. With This is with uh, passive cooling. With active cooling, you can probably do it in, uh, wait a sec, what happened? Um. Seeing is uh, not very good right now. It's a good thing we, we took an image earlier. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, this one, it's not necessary. You know, uh, this has been cooled overnight. So it's, uh, it's 5 a.m. here right now. So there's really no need to cool this OTA. So everything, you, you, you set the limit here. Um, if you want to use AVI or SIR, the, the filters are basically switched automatically. So uh, I don't have to do uh, manual switching of the filter. So everything is controlled through ASCOM. Ooh, seeing is not good. Yeah, I just noticed this is dropping. So Chris, while we're waiting for this, how long have you been doing this? I mean, how long did it take you to get to this point? I, I started uh, imaging planets uh, in 2003 uh, during the great Mars opposition and I basically started uh, imaging Jupiter in 2004. Uh, this is a slow process. Um, you know, we, we learn along the way. Um, we learn from others. Uh, when I started, I, I, you know, I had some few imagers help me like, um, Eric Nang from Hong Kong, Wei Leong Tan in Singapore. Uh, there's this guy, uh, uh, Dominic Derrick in uh, Belgium. And um, of course, Damien Peach was there to help me out. And along the way, uh, you know, we, we get advices from uh, Anthony Wesley, um, Don Parker, uh, you know, a lot of imagers really helped out. And uh, I wouldn't say that, you know, uh, in, in my case, I'm still learning uh, from people on how to get things done. Um, you know, my way of imaging isn't really, I don't really want to get, you know, the best images every night. Uh, you know, my, my goal is to get scientific data. Right now we're supporting the Juno spacecraft. So uh, in, I think April 10, uh, we're gonna have another perigeobe. So this is the actually the region that, uh, what we're imaging right now is the region where uh, Juno is going to image uh, in, 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 in three days. Uh, what day is today? Uh, uh, today is, uh, oh, no, uh, no, next, uh, on, on April 10, that's next week, uh, next week, Saturday. So this is the region that Juno will uh, have a high resolution image uh, late, later on uh, uh, next week. So uh, this data would be very important for, for uh, professional astronomers. Those are using Juno. And uh, there's another thing with my workflow. Uh, I have a limited amount of time. I like now, now, right now we have a long vacation. Uh, in fact, we have an indefinite vacation. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those days where, uh, uh, you know, after some time you look forward to work now. <laughs> you know, it's always you look forward for a weekend, but you know, normally uh, I would, you know, uh, I have limited amount of time that I can do. I have kids, I have work. Uh, so uh, I can have a limited amount of time that I can capture 
or else I'm going to be stressed out in the office and uh, my wife might start complaining. And uh, I have limited amount of time in processing the, the, the stuff that I have. Uh, so uh, I try to be to have an efficient workflow. Um, so this is uh, what you would need. You have to have a workflow from uh, this uh, preparation, preparing your telescope to, 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 to capture. Uh, you know, imaging right now is actually a challenge. Uh, uh, waking up at uh, very early in the morning is not that easy. <laughs> You know that uh, warm bed. Uh, it's it's difficult to to get up out of the bed at three, four, four thirty, or five a.m. just to image Jupiter. But uh, it's it's fun. Uh, it, it's challenging. I know we covered this uh, yesterday, but uh, people are asking uh, which camera are you using and why. I'm using a QHY uh, two ninety. Um, I'm I'm happy with this telescope. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's actually a cooled version. Uh, one thing I like about QHY is their cameras are sealed. And uh, one thing I don't have a problem with, with QHY compared to other cameras is dust. And uh, for me, dust is one of the biggest problems because there is, I've tried, I've spent over thousands of dollars and of different methods. In fact, I have an electrostatic gun <laughs> in my cabinet. Uh, just to, uh, you know, uh, I thought that it would help in removing dust, but uh, there's really no way with the current chips that we have, the big chips, to get dust perfectly out. And uh, so far with my experience with uh, the ni nitrogen uh, sealed uh, cameras, which QA, QHY has, um, you know, it's, it's, it's dust sealed. So I, I never had problem with dust. And uh, so far, I've worked with QHY in improving their driver. So uh, if you notice, everything is flawless. Uh, as you move from filter to filter, there's really, uh, or when you do binning, you don't have any crashes. Everything is flawless. Yeah, I, I mean, I've got to admit, they've come such a long way from, from the early days. And they've, I mean, this is the thing about QHY and other competitors for the CMOS technology is they've made astronomy affordable for most of the people out there. I mean, when you pick up one of their QHY cameras, I mean, instinctively, you're, you're getting a serious piece of hardware right here. And, you know, you'd be thinking yep. you'd be paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for it, and you don't, you know, they're that's all true. affordable. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Well, uh, QHY has a $50,000 camera. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, yeah, they but, do. But, 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 but in the end, yeah, it's really affordable. And uh, you know, uh, to have a dedicated planetary camera, uh, this is something that uh, QHY and Z ZWO did. Because before we used to get cameras from uh, um, uh, like uh, security ca uh, security uh, security cameras, and the problem with these is that um, uh, you know we really had to talk to them to modify the way they capture, uh, you know, uh, to, to make it suit for astronomical purposes. And uh, to have, uh, you know, a cooling system, even though I don't use a cooling system, uh, is, is, is uh, something which is very important for me. Uh, if you notice the temperature here, it's, uh, it's 29 degrees. If I use the uncooled version of, uh, uh, of this camera, uh, the temperature would be around, you know, 50, 50, close to 60 degrees now. Well, we can actually see the sun coming up on the cat on, on your uh, other <laughs> camera. It's it's getting bright really fast. Yeah, it's uh, it's gonna get bright. So we have to go to um, Mars right now. Give me a second. I'll I'll move the telescope to Mars. Okay. So while he's doing that, uh, I'm just gonna remind everybody, if you're if you wanna enter our draw for a $50 gift certificate make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and subscribe to our Instagram and send us a direct message um, you can enter as many times as you want I guess but it only counts as one entry because we only see your name once ultimately um, so yeah just go ahead and do that it's a $50 gift certificate we will be announcing the winner probably sometime on Monday or Tuesday uh, depending on the full person that is actually dealing with it and how inundated they get. 
So yeah, um, feel free to fire off some questions. Um, Mike, in reference to your question, which mount is he using? He's using a AP900. We did that a little bit earlier, so. Oh, whose phone's going bing? So if you're looking at the uh, the videos down at the bottom, you can just about see uh, Chris fiddling around with the scope. Oh, I see something. Uh, hi, good morning, Mars. Okay, here we have Mars over here. Now, one thing about fire capture, um, yeah. Uh, you can actually save settings on different planets. So here we have Jupiter. Now we're going to go to Mars. And uh, we, I already have the settings for Mars here. Hmm. So, uh, okay. Oh, scene's really gone down, hasn't it? No, uh, Mars is very low right now. It's around oh. 30 degrees, so. Uh, it's it's very close, you know. It's it's. Uh, <coughs> uh, we're a few minutes from sunrise, so the the air is starting to get get unstable as it heats up. Um, let's see the red. Okay, we'll just do a little capture. Um, it it doesn't take long to uh, capture for for. Uh, let's see. I need to increase new limit, um, 40 seconds, okay. Or, uh, let's do it 45. So I'm doing a 45 second capture for Mars. Um, it doesn't really look good, but later on with processing, this should, uh, you can see the polar caps on Mars. And uh, I think this is the area around Maris Cimmerium. I think more or less. Um, okay. So you notice uh, Mars has a higher surface brightness, even though how small it is right now, it's about six arc seconds right now. And uh, I'm using a faster exposure time compared to Jupiter and even lower gain on red because uh, it's, it's just a, right now, it's a high surface brightness planet. I would say Mars would be the easiest planet to capture. And later on this year, uh, for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, or for us in the Northern Hemisphere, Mars will be perfectly placed. Uh, it will be about 22 arc seconds. Hey, is there something wrong with my focus? Things seems to be, wait a sec. Let me redo the focus. Uh, yeah, it was a little out of focus. Sorry about that. Looks better now. Yeah. Seeing is a little better. Uh, it was out of focus, sorry. So I'll just have to delete these two. Mm. Ah, looks better now. The tiny Mars. <laughs> Which actually is your favorite planet to actually image? Uh, well, uh, well, for me, Jupiter is the most dynamic. Uh, Saturn is probably the most beautiful, but it takes quite some time to image Saturn. Saturn, actually, you can see Saturn now. Um, if you look at the sky now, you can see the three planets lining up, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. Uh, what is interesting was that last, uh, last time I imaged Mars, I think two weeks ago, Mars was actually close to Jupiter, but right now Mars seems to be moving away from, uh, in fact, uh, Saturn is in between Mars and Jupiter now. So yeah, I think uh, this summer we're going to have a really good view of all the planets, especially when they're all grouped together. Yeah. I mean, the last time it happened was like three, four years ago for us. Uh, you know, one thing crazy is this November, uh, Saturn and Mars is going to have a very close conjunction. They would be around six arc minutes away from each other. This is going to be a very, very close encounter between these two planets. Uh, very rare, really, uh, to, to have these two. This is blue. You can see that the blue is featureless, and uh, you can see the polar caps and some hints of clouds. That's it. I mean, that's all you should see with Mars. 
if you see some albedo features then there's a you know you might or if 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 your blue image is bright then there must be some leak light leak uh, ir leak on your filter <clears throat> so, don't, so don't substitute with bad filters no okay there we go mm. You'll notice that the eastern, uh, the, the, you know, the left side of uh, Mars is very bright compared to the, I wonder what's going on there. Uh, answer to George Hall's question, it, why doesn't he use the auto guiding? Um, we've actually answered that earlier on in the stream. Uh, it, it's basically to do with, mm -hmm. it's not in its optimal point. Plus, he was setting it up so quickly that he didn't really have time to get all of that stuff working right off the bat. Yeah, the reason why I, I don't do auto guiding early in the morning is, first of all, my brain isn't 100%. And right now, I don't really have that much time. Um, you know, early in the morning, the thing that I want to do is uh, image and go back to sleep. And uh, using the hand controller isn't really that bad. Right now, um, you know, uh, uh, my, my, my mouth is, uh, well, polar aligned. So um, I don't really have to do a lot of uh, adjustments uh, with 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 the, with the planets. Just a few clicks uh, here and there, and uh, you know, setting up the auto guiding um, yeah, takes takes time. Takes time. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do now, because sunrise is coming up, uh, we're gonna do uh, one last set of uh, after this three sets of uh, Mars and IR. Then I'm gonna demo to you. How um, how the uh, how to set up the filter wheel to make it automated? Okay, let's uh, lower this um, so you can see my camera. Okay, you can see my camera set up there. Oops, sorry, uh, last run. So you can see my telescope and camera there. Um, in fact, I, I just use a Telrad. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I think sometimes the uh, simplest is the easiest method. Yeah. Oh, uh, by the way, the, the camera. Oh, it's disconnected again. Okay. <laughs> um, which, is it this one? The other one, uh, well, I think that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, I think the laptop froze. Is it moving for you? No, it's not. Yeah, no, it's stuck for me. My laptop is OK. Uh oh. Just reboot that. OK, let me just reconnect it then. <coughs> I'm assuming you're using Wi-Fi and all that stuff. Oh yeah. It's probably what it is. Just let me know when the uh, laptop comes back up and I'll get you reconnected. No, oh, no, no, my, my laptop is okay. It's not, it, my laptop is okay. Oh, I can't connect to it now. Now, guys, just so you understand, uh, Chris is actually in the Philippines, and I'm here in California. So this is quite—it's quite a feat to be connecting two sides of the world together like this. Yeah, uh, we're gonna do IR. Then uh, we're gonna set. I'll show you how to set up the filter wheel. It's more than hundred percent. You're still connected with the uh, team viewer here. I'll reset uh, team viewer. Not on the other laptop. I'm connected to one of them, but not the other. Yeah, I'm connected to the ThinkPad. Try, try, try going uh, team viewer again.
Oh, wait a sec. I'm, I'm offline. I wonder why. Oh, that's probably what it is. Okay. Wait a sec. Um, okay. I'm online again. All right. Okay. This is the last IR. Okay. So we're on the last run here for IR. Okay. Okay. So we're done with imaging this morning. Um, so um, if you want to set up the filter wheel, all you have to go to is uh, here in the settings. First, you set up the motorized filter wheel and uh, basically initialize. And uh, you can get the choices here. This time I'm using the Starlight Express filter wheel. Uh, you can see the properties. It has seven filters. Uh, okay. Then, okay. Then um, once everything is set up, you go here, you go filters. here, filters. And uh, you make sure that uh, you can use RGB sequence. You place R, G, and B. I would recommend that you have a two second delay because uh, once the filter changes, uh, there's a slight vibration that happens and uh, jump to the first filter after the sequence. So you just check these. And one thing when you're using um, uh, here, fire capture, uh, where was that? Uh, file naming settings, capture settings. Use WinJupo's file naming convention. Always use this one. And uh, what else? Uh, Hey, Chris, your um, battery is at 26%. Somebody's just pointing that out to you. Oh, yeah, it's, it's this laptop, but the, okay. Oh, okay. We don't want to lose you halfway through. <laughs> okay, wait a sec. Let me power it up. Thank you for looking out for us, George. Oh, sorry, Gregory. Much appreciate that. Now you know we're actually live. Anything can go wrong. So again, if you haven't um, entered our $50 gift certificate draw, uh, you've got to subscribe to our YouTube channel and subscribe to our Instagram account and then send us a direct message. And then the winner will be announced probably on Monday or Tuesday. So don't delay, get subscribing. Okay. And uh, do you guys have any have any questions? Um, is a telescope in old as mode equivalent to equatorial when imaging the planet since the cameras have a high frame rate with only 30 to 60 seconds exposure? Um, uh, we actually have, uh, I, I, I've tried imaging out as, but um, I was using a uh, 2.4 meter uh, uh, Richie Critian in, in Thailand. Oh, the seeing is better. Let me do a little capture with Mars while we're, while we're talking. Um, uh, uh, we had a field rotator. So you probably need a field rotator. I'm not sure. I think a few people uh, a few years ago, we were, they were using Dobsonian on imaging, a track Dobsonian. And uh, they were able to get good images, but I think when you're using the rotation, that might be a problem. Oh, did I did I miss a question from uh, Greg about another question in regards to oh, as if you don't mind, just type it again, and yeah. uh, we'll answer that for you. Uh, George is asking, what arc second per pixel are you imaging at? Um, right now it's around 0 0.1314 arc second per pixel. So this is very, really very high resolution. 
Okay, so another question would be is, are you using a Barlow? And if so, what are you using? I'm actually, yeah, I'm using an astrophysics Barcon. Um, this is the Barlow I've been using since the beginning. Uh, the reason why I use this is it's a variable Barlow and uh, the quality is actually pretty good. Um, I never had a problem with it. Uh, yeah, it's a two inch Barlow. You can actually see my setup right now uh, as the sun rises. Later on, we'll, we'll have a close up. After I do this Mars imaging, I will do a close up with my setup. Mm. I think you can see it here right now. Oh, seeing is very good now. Go figure. So just imagine Mars is only 6.3 arc seconds right now. So it's, it's tiny. Later on this year, it'll be 22 arc seconds. So it'll be a lot bigger later this year. You'll see that um, uh, I, I don't have anything fancy on my telescope. I don't even use go too early in the morning. Uh, since planets are bright, I just use my um, Telrad. Uh, do you ever do deep sky imaging? Uh, well, once in a while I do, uh, rarely. The problem I have here is that I have uh, horrible light pollution here in my area. So I don't really do a lot of deep sky here. But once in a while, uh, I, I can image comets. Uh, but when I do deep sky, I normally don't use this telescope. I use my astrophysics refractor for deep sky. Yeah. Oh, so, since you just mentioned refractors, is there a difference other than focal length? Is there a big difference with imaging between a refractor and a reflector for doing planets? It's aperture. Uh, you know, a seven inch refractor would cost a hundred times more than a seven inch Schmidt Cassegrain. So, uh, you know, uh, you cannot imagine owning a 14 inch refractor. <laughs> well, the, the funny thing is, is I actually have access to a, uh, a 230 refractor that we're probably going to use in the summertime to do uh, planetary mm -hmm. imaging. You're better off with a C14. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'd just like to try that out. Yeah. Or even a C11 would be, would be much better. But you know, refractors are very nice telescopes, um, but you know, they're good for wide field deep sky. And that's what they're made for. Um, probably for planetary, it might be less expensive and easier to mount a reflector or a cat. And this, it's, 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 you know, it's, it boils down to budget. <laughs> right. I mean, out of all the different type of reflector telescopes, which one really is the best one? I mean, we've got quite a few choices. You have a Mac Newt, a Mac Cass, um, you have Newtonians, obviously, SCTs, you have RCs, uh, you have the plane wave CDKs. I mean, in your opinion, I, I know you've used the C14, which we can see. Yeah, but I've, I've also used a CDK. They're nice, but they're way out of my league. <laughs> well, have you actually used it for imaging and do you actually see a noticeable difference? Uh, I, I was in Thailand, we have a one meter CDK there. Um, I, I, I do a joint project with Narit in Thailand and uh, we actually use their CDKs there. Uh, they're actually good, but the thing is, um, you know, a one meter CDK is about a million dollars. <laughs> way out of my budget. <laughs> Oh, they could always loan one to you, I guess. <laughs> well, that'll be nice. But uh, really, um, realistically, um, you know, if, if I could afford, I, I'll probably get a 24-inch classical Cassegrain. Uh, that'll be nice. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, budget-wise, um, uh, probably on my dreams. <laughs> okay, after the stream ends, we need to talk, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay, we're done with imaging. Um, uh, any other questions with uh, with regards to the camera? Um, not yet. I'm so, sure people uh, are going to keep on sending questions in. Okay, because I'm going to shut down fire capture because uh, uh, in a few minutes uh, the sun's going to rise. And uh, anyway, um, I'll, I'll I'll give you a tour around. 
uh, I don't have a portable uh, um, uh, camera, so um, I'm just going to show you. Um, so this is my imaging system, uh, the flip mirror and the Crayford focuser um, here. And uh, this is the cable that goes through the controller. Uh, this is the flip mirror. Uh, you know, the flip mirror is really a lifesaver, especially early in the morning. It, you know, it, it's really frustrating to get uh, the planet into the field of view of the camera uh, if you don't have a, uh, this Crayford focuser. Uh, in my case, this is uh, an old Crayford focuser. It's a homemade Crayford focuser. I think uh, a few companies still sell. I'm not sure. I think Vixen sells one. Uh, you can you can you can search around, but uh, you know having a flip mirror really is a lifesaver. Uh, the Crayford uh, you have to have a heavy duty Crayford focuser because uh, these can be heavy. You have the filter wheel here. This is the Starlight Express and the QHY 290 over here. So um, for now, you know my system works very well. For, for, for the setup. And it looks like you're on a peer mount, is that right? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a portable peer. And, uh, you know, uh, you never go wrong with the astrophysics mount. Um, you know, I've been using that for since 2003. It has never failed me. Although, you know, I, I had to change some cables. I have some backups on pr practically all the cables that I have here, just to make sure that I could image every night or every clear night. But overall, you know, this 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 uh, mount is, uh, you can't go wrong with this mount. So this is actually a question that was sent to us earlier. And since you've actually got your camera up, can you talk about your cooling setup? Because it seems different. It almost looks custom. No, this is the ordinary uh, QHY uh, for the telescope. Yeah, for the telescope. Oh, I never used that. <laughs> Actually, when I bought it, I bought my telescope secondhand. And uh, it has a Piltier cooler, but uh, uh, it was a big hassle to use it. So in the end, I just gave up. I, I never used it. Uh, hopefully, in, in in a few months' time, when 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 this thing is over, um, uh, I'll probably get a newer uh, Schmidt Cassie grain, because uh, my 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 problem with the C14 is that I'm um, the optics isn't really uh, good right now. Uh, it has some. Uh, do inside. Yeah, I really have to open this up and clean it. But uh, right now, um, I don't have the guts to do that. <laughs> I, I'm a bit nervous to open things up, even though, you know, I've been to the Celestron factory and seen how they do this. But still, uh, you know, uh, it, it works for me, then uh, I'll still keep on using it until I get the new one. So another question here is, would there be any benefit of using, say, the Edge HD version over a, a, a standard version? I don't see any big difference. You know, Damien Peach uses the Edge version. So uh, the only reason I would <coughs> prefer the standard probably is to light, more light, because uh, the Edge has a lens on the uh, close to the, you know, the the, the you know, the back end and that lens uh, you probably lose about three three to five percent of the light that comes in so uh, that's basically probably the only difference but uh, flexibility wise I would I would probably prefer the edge so if they made a 24 inch of the uh, edge you'd probably grab that then <laughs> Uh, my problem is having a 24-inch edge uh, is to mount it. <laughs> I don't think my AP900 could handle it, so I probably need a, a bigger mount for that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, then again, you know, when I got this mount, uh, I got this for uh, half the price of what it's selling now. So I, I'm happy. <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. So just out of interest, um, what other cameras have you used other than the 290? Well, I started imaging with a 2U cam, the Philips 2U cam. Uh, that was uh, ages ago. Then um, I started using the imaging source, uh, uh, the MK21. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, there was a time I used the point gray camera. Uh, basically then, uh, uh, for quite some time, uh, 
I used uh, some of the Celestron cameras, uh, which was the imaging source cameras, the Skyris cameras. And, uh, you know, um, what, uh, once they stopped developing cameras uh, and the 290 came up, then this is where I started using QHY 290. So another question here is, can you use an off-axis guider instead of a flip mirror? Um, you know, one thing, uh, the, the thing is you use the, the flip mirror to center the object. And off, I, I wonder if the off-axis guider would do that. I don't think so, because that's why it's called an off-axis guiding. It picks off on the edge. The reason why we're having the flip mirror is because we want to get the planet into the field of view. So it's easier for us to manipulate, uh, you know, to, to center. Uh, you know, without the flip mirror, it'll probably take you 20 minutes to, to get the planet into the field of view. So uh, it, it, it saves time. And especially right now, I don't have 20 minutes. You want to, to have everything in seconds. And one thing nice about the flip mirror earlier, when we were imaging, in methane band, uh, you notice that I had to close the flip mirror to take dark, to take dark frames. That's, that's going to make things very easy for us. And one thing you'll notice in fire capture, um, I, I wonder if you noticed this one when, when we were imaging in fire capture, is that it saves all the settings. Uh, so don't, you don't have to go through every, uh, you know, you don't have to set up everything all over again. Uh, let's see. Oh, there's Mars. Hi, Mars. Uh, if you notice, um, let's say, let's place this Mars in the center. Oh, are we going back to uh, your screen? Hold on one okay. second. Hold okay. on one second. Am I on the right machine? The other machine. Oh, it's not this one? Oh, yeah, this one, this one. Okay, we're, we're there. Now, if, if on, you look hold at on, the, hold on. Uh, okay, I'm trying to get the thing to do the screen share. Where is it gone? Uh oh, hold on. What happened? Uh, I'm trying to get the screen sharing back. I don't know why I lost it. Oh, it's me. Uh, just in case. Sun's coming up. You can see the sun is almost coming up now. Look at the red thing over there. It'll be sunrise soon. I'm actually on top of a hill. So um, there we go. I'm actually on top of the hill, so you can really see the sea over there. And the uh, sunrise is coming up. You can see the sunrise there. OK, you got. Now, uh, you'll notice that in Fire Capture, um, they actually uh, save the settings. So that's why when I go to methane ban, it goes straight to binning. So uh, uh, you know. When it goes back to IR, it saves all the setting of IR. This is Jupiter, so uh, Mars is currently overexposed, but you can see every setting is saved from the uh, uh, exposure, uh, the, the, the integration time, uh, 30 seconds, uh, exposure time, gain. It will save the last settings that you have. So, so for each planet that we have, uh, this is one thing nice about fire capture because it saves everything. And you'll notice that each filter that I use have different uh, gain settings. So this is 372. This is for Jupiter and for green, it's 389. Of course, this changes as, uh, you know, depending on the transparency and uh, seeing. So uh, uh, this is one advantage of uh, fire capture. Uh, so one of the questions is, um, Ooh, I lost it there. I'm going to scroll back down to it. The exposure times that you were using, 
there's no actual magical setting that they're always based upon what you physically see. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, it, it, it's just like uh, uh, when you ask somebody, uh, when you drive a car, what gear should you use? So it depends whether you're on a highway or on a side street. So it all depends uh, on, on your conditions. Uh, everything is variable. Uh, even here in the Philippines, you know, you don't, you don't get 10 over 10 seeing perfect transparency every night. Transparency is always different, whether you have a haze, uh, a smog, or you know, wh wh whatever, uh, or everything is perfect. So uh, things are different, settings are different. So you have to live with it. We'll so is, uh, is Saturn up right now? I mean, could we just have a quick look at Saturn? No, uh, it's already, uh, you can see the sky now, it's blue. <laughs> you can't see Jupiter even, or Mars for that matter. Oh, it looks like we, oh, is this, are you just playing back the footage or is this still live? This is live. Oh, okay. Look, look this is blue now. You can see the background, it's already very Ah, uh, yes, it's starting to wash out, that's right. Yeah, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, it's uh, basically over now. So basically, we'll process this tomorrow. I I'm going to process this today. But um, uh, to tomorrow, we're going to have a uh, workshop on how to process all these images. So if you have any questions on processing. Oh, yeah, one thing about uh, uh, you'll notice about QHY cameras uh, compared to other cameras, the gain is all on uh, proper dB. So uh, let let's say it's 280, it's uh, 28 dB. And uh, you'll notice that it has extended gain up to 730 dB. So uh, this is one thing nice uh, of uh, the QHY camera. Uh, one, one setting that you have to bear in mind is the Q USB traffic. Remember, other cameras and the uh, QHY, they have different settings for QH, uh, the USB traffic. For high-speed capture, I would always recommend for USB traffic, you use uh, three. This is only for QHY cameras. Other cameras, they have different settings and uh, I cannot really tell because I haven't really used the other cameras and uh, I'm not familiar with them. So for QHY, if you're using USB traffic, the best is three. Uh, so somebody's asking, uh, and I know we covered this yesterday, but do you need to refocus between each filter? Red and green, no problem. Uh, normally that's why we focus on uh, green. Uh, for uh, blue, it's slightly out of focus. Hey, good morning. The sun's up. Yeah, we can see it. <laughs> I have to start taking down my my stuff now. So, um, oh, so real quick then, before you take it all down, hmm. how do you normally store everything? I mean, do you leave that stuff up or do you throw a cover on it? Uh, yeah, I, I I'll show you the cover. Uh, the, there's the cover over there. And who makes so that? The, uh, I, I may uh, have it custom made here locally. Oh, you had it made um, custom made. Yeah, so Telegizmos uh, sells a cover, the yes, Telegizmo yes, uh, 365. Yeah, did, 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 uh, I, I used to use Telegizmo, but uh, I found it cheaper just to buy it here. Uh, but uh, actually, Telegizmos, I used to use that. Uh, but uh, because of our weather here, it doesn't really that last that long. Probably about four or five years, then I have to change it. Uh, I have to change the cover because of the sun and rain. And uh, yeah, and uh, I store everything here in, in this box. So the cameras will go in. Uh, the only thing I leave out is the telescope and uh, the mount. All right then. So Chris is gonna start packing some of his stuff up. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna play a quick promo video and we're going to come right back and then we're just going to open this up to more questions, questions okay. and we'll go from there. All right, so don't go away. We're just going to take a quick break. So if you need to pee, now's the time. I'm Jen Winter and I own Daystar Filters and we're actually out of Warrensburg, Missouri, flyover country out there. We have lots of square footage, lots of acreage and big blue sky. I've had a very strong math background and I was studying mechanical engineering very early on, but I also was heavily into photography, scanning things, I worked in a newspaper, so I was in media with a math background or math with a media background. The two came together when I met my late husband, Vic, who was an astrophotographer with a Kansas City Star. And I was instantly hooked on astrophotography because it was a marriage of that art and science both in together. and. 
uh, Vic really got me addicted pretty early. He, he pulled a 16-inch Dobsonian out and put it on Saturn, and the rest was history. It's one of the worst place, ways to get hooked, of course, Saturn. How many people hooked on Saturn? I always like to refer to a story when I was in school. We had a gentleman who was working in Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas, and I was going to school there, and a gentleman discovered there was, a grad student said, what do you mean we have a planetarium and nobody goes to here? So he went around to every school, everywhere, brought every student, every, um, every person in town went to the planetarium that year. And in my little group, as we were going up to the top floor, we passed a room in this physics building, and then here were these guys in their little brown corduroy suits, just all excited because uh, Voyager was going by Saturn, Jupiter, I don't even remember because I was so small. But they, here they are, they're showing video of a planetary pass and getting data live. They were coming out of their skins, jumping up and down in the chair, and I'm like, well, you know, this is really interesting. And I was fascinated at that moment but I got dragged away to go to see the planetarium, which frankly, after seeing actual images of the planets, seeing the dots was a little bit less. Well, I think we need to get a little bit more hands-on and a little bit less hands-off. Uh, I'm finding that when we do outreach, and in our area of the country, there's an awful lot of outreach, but I find that the youth are becoming so addicted to their screens and there are so many good pictures of astronomical things out there that seeing something on the web is sufficient. They're satisfied by seeing these Hubble images. But when they have the chance to look through that telescope and see Saturn through the eyepiece, there's always a, a moment where they, they question, is this actually real? Am I actually seeing this? So that direct connection to the equipment, having a hands-on experience instead of a cyber experience, that makes more of an impact I, I see in getting them moved along further into astronomy. We found that schools have more difficulty getting uh, with budget issues. They're having difficulties getting people out to field trips for nighttime astronomy. But daytime astronomy, of course, you, you, you can go right to the school. We have outreach guys who can, uh, and there are even a lot of outreach support groups where you can participate and even have access to materials to get out and visit the schools. And during the daytime, the teachers are much more likely to have activities and the hands-on opportunities daytime versus nighttime. It helps a lot. The, the most important thing with the sun is, because the sun is so bright, astronomy is usually about collecting light and, and, and more light is better. But with solar observing, you're buying dark. The sun is already bright enough, so bright that it'll blind you. So with solar, we always have to reduce down the, the amount of light that's going to, uh, to damage your eyes through infrared and ultraviolet radi radiation. Uh, but also, if you reduce the light from wavelengths that you don't really care to see, then you can start to pick out uh, details that you wouldn't otherwise. And, and the hydrogen is all about, you, perhaps you remember in chemistry that you have these little emission lines that uh, in a spectrum you see lights light up in different colors. So we're going to isolate the color of light that hydrogen emits. So then, then you can, and hydrogen and helium is what the sun is made of. So then you get to see what the sun is really doing instead of it just being a big, big circle. Hydrogen alpha will be the brightest line, uh, and if we got more complicated, there are energy levels and how much energy it takes to make different wavelengths of light. Hydrogen also gives, uh, the alpha line gives a more interesting view of the sun. So you have it's more interesting, it shows more contrast, it's brighter, and it represents an energy level that physicists are interested in the science from. A lot of times folks don't quite uh, realize that the sun is a star. It's the most fundamental concept about astronomy and about actually solar physics. Everybody gets excited. There's even, what is this, the new TV show Rick and Morty is all about physics, all about the physics. Well, we happen to have a really cool physics experiment. Einstein's theory of relativity references things like the sun in it. And so, so solar physics is astronomy, except up close in a way that we can watch it change hour to hour, day to day. We're still today, even Citizen Kate is learning more about. The Citizen Kate was the project where they were looking at the sun during the eclipse. And we're still doing real science on the sun every single day to learn more about physics that we didn't know yesterday. So I like solar versus nighttime just for that um, interactive aha moment where it's not just black and white dots.
just let me know when. All right, we are back with Chris. Um, we're just going to give you a quick sneaky peeky of what he's doing right now with some of the processing. Uh, we will cover all of this in depth tomorrow. So this is not the actual processing. We're just being impatient. We just want to see some stuff. Okay, this is uh, the image we got this morning. This is uh, how it is, looks stacked. Let's see. Doesn't look bad, not bad. You can see the oval BA and the great red spot and the wake of the great red spot. You can see the difference uh, without wavelets and after wavelets. That's, that's quite amazing that is. Yeah. And uh, I don't know because it doesn't really look nice on my laptop screen, but it'll look nice on my desktop screen. <laughs> oh, it definitely looks good over here. I tell you that much. I mean, yeah. the, the amount of detail is astounding. Yeah. And this isn't even the perfect seeing. This is about probably around seven. Let's check Mars because Mars is uh, faster to process. Uh, So what do we have here? So you were asking uh, the, how do we use this? Mm -hmm. oh, this is gonna be interesting because I think we'll, we'll be able to see some of the volcanoes. Oh, really? We'll see. Um, George Hall is asking, how many frames did you capture on average? Uh, hi, George. Uh, nice to hear from you. Uh, 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 basically, well, uh, it depends on condition. Uh, it's, it's, there's really nothing specific. Uh, uh, there you go. Uh, well, this is a little over process. I need to, um, here. Yeah, this is Olympus Mons over here. Oh, wow. And this is uh, Elysium. So, uh, yeah, you can see some volcanoes. <laughs> and so Olympus Mons is actually the largest volcano in the solar system. Yes, it's the, yeah, the largest, highest volcano in the solar system. And uh, what else do we see here? Not much really because uh, Jupiter, uh, Mars is still very small. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think we'll get more information here. Now, again, guys, we will be covering the processing part of this tomorrow um, at 4 p.m. Pacific time. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, what we're seeing, the white thing is really, this is Olympus Mons and this is Elysium. Yeah. So we can really see this is Olympus Mons and clouds over Elysium. So not bad. Uh, we still have the polar hood, polar caps on Mars. This, this wasn't a bad image <laughs> for uh, this time of the year. <laughs> Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, well, no, we've any? got, yeah, there's, there's tons coming through now. Okay. Um, I, I know we're going to answer this one tomorrow, Greg, so please come back tomorrow. Um, I know you're probably curious about the, the wavelets thing, but he will explain all of that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin is asking, do you need to be careful to not let exposure times get so long that you actually miss a lucky image and seeing goes from good to bad during the same frame? How long yes. does an instance of this, of good seeing last? Uh, really, in my case, um, I can predict more or less how, how good seeing will be. Uh, well, it depends on where you are. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, use the highest frame rate that you can with your system. Uh, if, uh, in my case, I'm using close to 100 frames per second. And uh, you're talking about, you know, in this location, the seeing is actually pretty good. 
uh, sometimes you get about uh, usually this type of the year is supposed to be nine to ten over ten seeing every night, but uh, we still have winter weather right now. So even this late, uh, well, uh, quotation mark winter weather, winter winds. We still have the northeast monsoon, which is uh, supposed to end uh, last month, but uh, it's supposed to be summer here right now, uh, the hot hot season, but it seems to be delayed. So uh, during this time, uh, when when seeing is good, uh, you can actually do slower frame rates. Well, it all it depends on your camera, telescope, focal ratio. Uh, there's really no fixed thing. You really have to find your sweet spot. Uh, this is a question that was submitted earlier, um, or actually from yesterday. Is there any difference in using larger pixels? Um, the general consensus would be big telescope, big pixels, small telescope, small pixels, but is there any massive advantage over using a, a camera with larger pixels? Because you use the, two nine, uh, the 290, which is only a 2.9 micron. Well, um, it depends on really on your seeing and your, your location and also the telescope type you're using. If you're using a Schmidt Cassegrain, in, in fact, I, don't, I wouldn't mind if I have a larger pixel, but the thing is uh, my Barlow will have to work some more. Uh, I may have to use extension tubes uh for for my system to to get the magnification that i need but uh really uh it depends on your system uh honestly i'm not happy with the way that the pixels are going smaller and smaller uh i'm happy probably around three to four microns so what would be the but, ideal micron size for your particular scope sorry my cat just uh, decided to get uh, up there uh <laughs> it's okay, no problem. Uh, it, it's not really about uh, the micron size, but the sensitivity of the telescope. Oh no, the sensitivity of the chip that I look at, because of the, uh, the basically the QE of the chip, more than anything, than more than the the pixel size. Because so when the, you're so when you're referring to QE though, quantum efficiency, what is the actual number that they should be looking for? Uh, it depends, but. Uh, right now, you, you, I would prefer the BSIs, the back illuminated chips like the 290, because they're far more sensitive. Right now, the the 290, even I think most most cameras right now have almost the same QE, uh, the 178, uh, even the 163. They they in in RGB they have more or less the same QE, but uh, in fact I think even with the uh, you know, in, in, in IR, the, the QE of the 163 and the 290 are about the same. The only difference is the pixel size. The, the pixel size of the 290 is slightly bigger, 2.9 versus 2.4 with the 163. So, uh, well, it, it boils really down to that. Um, I, I prefer larger pixels for in this case if the QEs are the same. And uh, one thing I'm waiting for right now really is uh, uh, you know, there are two types of CMOS, the rolling shutter and uh, what was that? Um, global shutter. The two, global shutter. Um, I'm waiting for the BSI global shutter. That will be a game changer. Oh, yeah, definitely. Especially um, when, mm. So I think Sony is supposed to be coming out with that in 2021. Yes, I've been waiting for that. And uh, hopefully when that thing comes out, uh, I'll probably upgrade to a newer camera. And one thing I like about that camera is that I think the pixel size are bigger, so they'll be good. So do we have any more questions on the live chat? I mean, I see a lot of comments, which uh, we much really appreciate. Um, mm. This is my cat, it's a she. So yeah, I have a space cat. And funny enough, if you're looking for a space cat or a red cat from William Optics, we actually have them in stock, believe it or not. So if you <laughs> haven't already bought one, don't hang around because they're going to be gone real soon. Oh, since I forgot you could yeah. look on your uh, internet, people are yeah. asking how to find you on social media and things like that. So here's your chance. Um, this, isn't, this isn't really social media, but this is my um, uh, website, uh, astro.christone.net. Uh, uh, this is my Jupiter image. So this is my Jupiter image last year when uh, Jupiter was higher in the sky. So, um, and much bigger 
So you can see the details on the, this is uh, what you can do with good seeing uh, uh, Jupiter closer to us, close to opposition. And uh, you can see all the details there, <laughs> even inside the great red spot. I think I still have some nice image. A uh, quick answer to your question, George. Um, is there a number on that camera? Um, I don't know if they've announced it officially, so I'm not going to say anything about it. Uh, I actually have the number, but uh, uh, until me. it's uh, until it's, it's released, <laughs> then uh, I'm, I'm not supposed to talk about it. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> I actually, um, Sony has released some specs of the camera, and uh, one thing nice, it's huge. About I think one inch chips. Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, that much we can say, but we're not allowed to say too much about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you can see the Jupiter here with the, you can even see details inside the great red spot. Is this probably one of the okay, best images so that you've taken so far? Uh, I don't think so. Probably show, one you know what, show images. us the best image you've taken so far. I really don't know. Um, I really can't say which is the best. Uh, uh, you know that that thing doesn't really concern me. Um, uh, it's it's <laughs> basically you know how much we can contribute to science more than anything else. Well, uh, hold but, uh, let's keep know, on this, this is, picture this for a second because there's something yeah. actually quite interesting going on on this picture. Is if you look at the red spot. You can all you can see how some of it is actually spilling out almost. Yeah, this is the flaking event that we had last year. It, it, this was in the news last year where uh, we have these small ovals that went through the halo, and basically uh, extracted some red material out of the great red spot. Uh, people thought that the great red spot was shrinking because of this, but after this event, there was really, uh, you know. Uh, uh, the Great Red Spot really survived unscathed with this. So you can see, you know, uh, this is one night. You can see this one is very good seeing, and uh, this one is not so good seeing. So even in one night, you can see changes in the seeing conditions. This is the IR and the methane band. And you can see a lot of interesting things going on in the methane band. They're brightening. So uh, a lot of uh, interesting things going on. Real quick, what do those, those numbers at the bottom mean? I mean, you've got 18, 12, obviously that's universal time CH4 and methane bands. What's the other numbers there for? These are the central meridian of, 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 uh, of uh, Jupiter. There's one, two, and three. And you can get these in wind jupos. And you'll notice uh, earlier, uh, you notice the equatorial band is dim. This is last year. This year, the equatorial band is very bright. Remember when we took the image earlier mm -hmm. uh, of uh, the methane band? Where was that? Um, here. Um, if you look at the methane band image, uh, look, this this band is very bright. So so there's you know things are different every year with Jupiter. Nothing is always the same. So what's probably the best um, or the most interesting feature that you have captured since you've been doing this? I mean, you've said you've been doing this for well over 10, 15 years. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, well, uh, probably the most exciting was the impact on Jupiter on. Uh, uh, on uh, what's that? Uh, June 3, 2010. Do you have anything? Uh, did you image anything at that time? Yeah, I, I imaged the impact. <laughs> You're tons. Yeah. Look at this image. Look at here. Wait, wait a sec. I think I ha I'll have the full. This is the full video. This is the actual raw video I had of the, the June 3 impact. Uh, you see here, over oh, here? Oh, yeah, there it is. 
Now, you knew this was going to happen, or was this by chance? No, this was by chance. Uh, Anthony Wesley was the first one to to see it. I, I when I was taking this, I I wasn't really observing well. Um, it was uh, it wasn't until he he said that oh there was an impact that I went through my video and uh, saw this one over here. Look. Oh, so yeah, yeah. what happened was a, a a twenty meter asteroid or a comet struck Jupiter during that time. Oh, this would have been great if you had it in the methane band by chance. Uh, this was okay because um, in methane band, you have slow exposure time. This one, they were able to basically um, make a graph on how bright it was and basically estimate on how big the impact was from this data and uh, Anthony's data. And one thing, uh, coincident coincidentally, you know, Anthony was, we were imaging at the same time. And uh, what thing interesting, he was imaging in red and I was interest imaging in blue. Oh, right. So somebody's asking, do you have any footage of um, good seeing, like a, a nine out of 10 or a 10 out of 10? Uh, let's see if I have it here. Oh, by the way, George Hall was one of the other impact detect. Um, he also discovered an impact on Jupiter. So, hey, hi, George. Oh yeah, George is here. I, I know this guy. I, I've, I've met him a couple of times and uh, we, we communicate with each other. Uh, let's see if this, this is a good one. Uh, this is an old image. I oh, know this is a color image. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Go back, go back, go back, go back. Can we see that real quick? Because this gives a really good example of uh, mono versus color. Yeah, this is a color, color and uh, I, I was using the next image five. Uh, you, you can see. Uh, here's a sample of a color, and uh, it's uh, not very bright, but uh, you, you can see the details of the color image. So do you actually think there's a good, a big difference between shooting monochrome versus color? I mean, for a color one shot camera, this is really good. Yeah, but you should bear in mind that Jupiter was overhead during that time. Oh, that's true. Yeah, uh, right now, I don't think you can do that. Uh, let's see if I have some data, a uh, good seeing. It's, it's on my uh, desktop uh, where I have all the good data. Uh, let's see. No, I don't have it here. So do you exclusively shoot um, your stuff in the Philippines or do you actually have like a remote observatory set up? Do you have access to other things? No, no, I do everything here in Cebu. So it just goes to show everybody at home that you can do this kind of astronomy at home. You don't have to go out and buy telescope time or any of that crazy stuff if you've got the equipment you can do it at home well um <laughs> to a certain degree oh uh, well uh there's a actually uh, this is a plug-in for a friend of mine um uh uh up there in chile uh yuri Viletsky has a telescope there uh, i forgot the name and uh, you can actually rent time if you want to image planets uh, my friend Damien Peach does that, uh, especially right now when, uh, when, when, when the planets are low in the sky in the southern hemisphere. Uh, some people actually do that now. Uh, they go um, uh, basically image remote. But uh, in my case, since you know I live in the equator or close to the equator, so whether it's south or north doesn't really matter to me. Awesome. So... Yeah, we've got about five more minutes left before we finish this with Chris, because I'm sure he is probably dying to just jump back into bed now. No, uh, I, I'm already awake. <laughs> Are you what a guy? You guys want to see this? Oh, of course, we'll, we'll see everything you got. Well, what's this? Oh wait, uh, no, no. Uh, oh, so you've got stuff with Neptune and Uranus. No, this is not mine. This is Hubble images. Oh, okay.
Yeah, this is a Hubble image taken a few years ago. Actually, I also do some Hubble uh, processing for, for my team. I work with some uh, uh, professional astronomers and uh, we do uh, Hubble images. And uh, normally if you're dealing with Hubble images, you have to go through this FITS liberator thing and basically convert the images to TIFF from FITS. So it's, it's quite interesting. And uh, I'll show you some of the images I did. Uh, yeah, it's annoying. When, where was that? Um, so this is an image which I, I think you're familiar with this image of Hubble, uh, of Jupiter using the Hubble Space Telescope. I was the one who processed this image for them. And uh, you can see the, the, the press release here. So this image, uh, I was the one who processed for them. This is the official website. And you can see from the credits over here, see go <laughs> over here. Woo, there he is. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's fun to, to work with professionals and uh, yeah, from here. <laughs> Have you actually had a go at any of the new um, images that they pulled down recently? Because I've seen some like cracking shots that have come from that. Yeah, I was the one, I, I, proce I, I processed those images. Yeah, Saturn and uh, Jupiter images. I don't have it in, here in this laptop. I have it in another computer. Oh, you want to see? Yeah, this no, is we a video I made from, no, this is a video I made from the Hubble images. Uh, It's actually hidden here. You can see. That is pretty so this, crazy. Yeah, it took me about um, yeah three days to 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 make this video just processing different images to get this video. So that's probably going to be a good transition for ending this because we're yeah. talking about processing. So we'll have processing tomorrow. Exactly. Tomorrow we are going to be processing the data that Chris uh, acquired today that you just watched. Um, if you guys got any questions, feel free to send them over to me now. Uh, I will double check the live stream chat just to make sure that I didn't miss anything. And we will try and answer as many questions as possible. Um, Chris, thank you very much once again. I think we could hey. probably do this for hours, um, <laughs> you know, but you know, we have to cut this one because I'm sure everybody's going to want to go for breakfast, lunch and dinner at some point. And I think your breakfast might be coming up soon. Yes. <laughs> so once again, Chris, Thank you very much uh, for doing this. And we will see everybody tomorrow at uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time. So do not miss this. Um, don't forget, we also have uh, Tim Russ from Star Trek Voyager who will be joining us at around about one o'clock. And then at about two o'clock, we have Richard Wright. And after that will be Chris. Okay. All right then, guys. See you guys. Thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>